Hello, my name is René Raffray. I'm the ITER Blanket Section Leader and I'm the Blanket Integrated Product Team Leader and I'm going to make this talk which aims to introduce the functions, design and operation of the ITER Fusion Blanket to newcomers. First, what is a fusion reactor blanket? What image comes to mind when you think of a blanket? You think about cover, protection, warmth, maybe a cozy feeling. All of these are applicable to a fusion blanket, except perhaps for the cozy feeling. The blanket system surrounds the fusion plasma and blankets the outer component. Let's have a little recap about the fusion process and magnetic confinement to introduce the blanket and its functions. As you may know or recall, the fusion reaction is uh, basically the reaction of two heavy hydrogen isotopes, deuterium and tritium, which combine together to create a neutron and a helium atom or an alpha particle. But in order for this fusion reaction to occur, we need to heat the fusion fuel to very high temperature, about 150 million degrees C, to create the conditions for fusion. At these temperatures, a plasma is formed with the electrons separated from the nucleus. To maintain such a hot plasma and prevent it from touching the walls, a magnetic field cage is formed to confine the plasma particles within a donut shape. These high magnetic fields are produced by toroidal coils shown in blue here and poloidal coils shown in gray which need to use superconductors to avoid drawing large currents through an electrical resistance. These superconductors are cooled by liquid helium at 4 degrees absolute, 4 degrees Kelvin, or minus 269 degrees Celsius, to keep them at a sufficiently low temperature for them to have basically no electrical resistance. So in a tokamak reactor, you have a plasma shown here in yellow, which is going to be at a very high temperature, 150 million degrees C. This is about 10 times the temperature of the core of the sun. A little bit further, you're going to have a toroidal field coils, shown in blue here, which are cooled by liquid helium at 4 degrees Kelvin. 4 degrees Kelvin, to give you an idea, this is the background temperature of space. And these two extremes of temperatures are separated by a few meters. This is really an, ast an, an astounding temperature gradient. And it's hard to imagine that such a temperature gradient could occur anywhere in the universe. And what do you find right in the middle of these two extremes? The blanket, shown here in gray. Let's look now at the main functions of a fusion blanket. The first function is to provide shielding to reduce the heat and neutron loads in the vacuum vessel and next vessel components behind the blanket. As I said earlier, you have a fusion reaction, and out of the fusion reaction, 80% of the energy produced is carried by a neutron and the rest by the helium atom of the alpha particle. These highly energetic neutrons are neutral and cannot be controlled by either a magnetic field or an electric field, and they go wherever they want. So how do we deal with these pesky neutrons which seem to have a mind of their own regarding where they are going? We just blanket them. So the energy from these neutrons are transferred to the structure around the plasma, mostly to the blanket, before they reach the outer components, the vacuum vessel and superconducting coils and other components. Just to give you an idea of, of the energy of this neutron, a 14.1 MeV neutron, if there was nothing to stop it, if it was moving in empty space, it would reach the moon in about eight seconds. And the distance from the Earth to the moon is about 380,000 kilometers. Another function of a blanket system is to absorb the radiative and particle heat fluxes from the plasma. 20% of the fusion, of fusion energy is carried by the so-called alpha particles, the helium atom. These energy are deposited as radiative heat and particle fluxes on plasma facing components, the blanket first wall, and at the bottom, the diverter. The split between the energy deposited on the blanket and in the diverter depends on the plasma scenario and the phase. So the blanket first wall then has to be designed to accommodate such particle surface heat fluxes, which are typically of the order of one megawatt per meter square for ITER. Another function of a blanket is to provide a plasma facing surface 
which is designed for a low influx of impurities to the plasma. So producing and maintaining a plasma requires heating a gas to a very high temperature, as we just said. Electromagnetic radiation by electron impacting on impurities in the plasma is a large energy loss mechanism that cools down the plasma and make, makes it basic quenches the plasma and the reaction will stop. So to keep the plasma hot, we need, we need to minimize the impurities from the plasma casing components and the radiation losses. Typically, these radiation losses are proportional to the square of the atomic number of impurity. The atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus. It's called Z. So we have selected for the heater blanket, first of all, an armor which is a very low Z material, which is that's plasma friendly. This is beryllium. Beryllium has a, an, atom, an, an atomic number of four. Another function is to provide a limiting surfaces, a, to provide limiting surfaces that define the plasma boundary during startup and shutdown. To start up the plasma and eventually the reaction, the plasma starts in a circular limiter fraction, a limiter configuration, as you can see. Typically, it touches the first wall at the inboard. And then it grows and gradually changes the shape to have the more traditional D shape and then switches to what we call a diverter configuration with an X point form at the bottom near the diverter. The high result, resulting heat flux on the first wall during startup and also shutdown. Shutdown is the reverse pro uh, process. This is a key factor in designing the first wall. The blanket system also provides passage for and accommodate requirements of interfacing systems, in particular of plasma diagnostics. ITER, as an experimental device, includes an array of diagnostic systems, about 50 of them. This is for machine protection, for plasma control, for understanding the physics of burning plasma, and most of these diagnostic systems interface with the blanket to access the plasma, including in the case of ITER, all that is listed, all these diagnostic systems listed here, such as neutron activation lines, uh, bolometers, Rogowski coils, etc. And even in post ITER reactors, so demonstration reactor or commercial reactor, you also, you also need a number of essential diagnostic systems. Another very important function of a blanket system is to breed tritium to achieve tritium cell sufficiency. As you know, tritium is one of the fuel to produce fusion. It combines, it fuses with a deuterium to produce a neutron and a helium atom. But deuterium is readily available from seawater, but tritium is not, and is also expensive to purchase. So tritium breeding is essential for a fusion power plant. And how do we do that? We introduce lithium in the blanket, which will react with a neutron formed by the fusion reaction to produce tritium. Now, not all neutrons from the fusion reaction will be captured by the lithium, and the blanket then needs to have a neutron multiplier, such as beryllium or lead, which basically react with one neutron and produces two. So you multiply the number of neutrons, and then you can multiply the reaction of lithium and, and, and a neutron to produce tritium. And in so doing, the neutron energy deposited in, in the blanket is, in, is also enhanced, typically by a factor of 1.2 or 1.4. And finally, another main function of, of a blanket system is to remove the energy deposition with high quality for effective power generation. This means that we need higher temperature coolant, materials that can accommodate this higher temperature, and this allows to have a higher power cycle efficiency, typically a Rankine cycle for a, for, 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 for a water coolant or a Breton cycle for helium cool blanket. As an example here, you can see a Breton cycle where, where typically you can see the compressors and the, the turbine, which are used then to generate electricity. So the material and design that, that can accommodate these temperatures and also ion neutron influences. Ion neutron influences means that the component can stay longer uh, in the reactor given the, the, the neutron flux from the reaction, which means that you have a longer lifetime. So both the longer lifetime and the high temperature operation affect the economics and attractiveness of a fusion power plant. Let's look at a typical demonstration reactor, so-called demo, or commercial reactor uh, blanket designs. 
So typically, the, the next generation concepts would include either helium cooled or water cooled ceramic lithium breeder, where the lithium is used to breed tritium, with beryllium as a neutron multiplier. It could be also helium cooled or water cooled so called lead lithium eutectic, where the lithium there is a breeder, tritium breeder, and the lead will be the multiplier. It could also be a dual cooled liquid lead lithium and helium. And all of these will use low activation ferric steel as structural material to have a, a, a structural material with a reduced half life. And here I'll just show you an example of a typical dual cool lead lithium helium blanket concept. We have a helium coolant is used to cool the box and the first wall. And the lead lithium then flows slowly in the middle, removes the heat generated inside the lead lithium itself, and then flows out of the blanket, where then the tritium can be removed also from, from it and used as fuel for the reaction. Of course, there are a number of key issues that still need to be addressed, including the effect of man magneto-hydrodynamic uh, when flowing a liquid metal uh, in a magnetic field, and also electrical insulation integrity, material compatibility, and others. But typically, such a concept can be uh, can be used with a Breton cycle to generate electricity using helium as a secondary loop, where the, basically the heat is transferred from the, the, the coolant, the blanket coolant, to the secondary loop, which is then used to generate uh, electricity for a Breton cycle. Now let's look at the blanket concepts for the different phases of ITER. Just to recap a little bit on the different phases of ITER, ITER was established in 8687 as an international collaboration among the USA, the USSR at the time, European Commission and Japan, under the organization of the IAEA. From 88 to 91, the conceptual design activities were held in Garching, Germany, used to select the machine parameters and objectives. From 92 to 98, the engineering design activities phase which, uh, was, was held, where then the design was developed capable of ignition, but it turned out to be a very large and expensive design. Unfortunately, at the end of the EDA, the US decided to withdraw from the project. Then there was an extension to 2001 with the remaining parties, which searched for a less ambitious goal, a slightly smaller machine with reduced plasma, uh, reduced plasma power, but still uh, giving a lot of information, important information about uh, fusion reaction and how to produce fusion energy. Then the US rejoined, and then uh, other parties also were interested. And in 2006, uh, the ITA agreement was signed at the Elysee Palace in Paris among China, Europe, India, Japan, Korea, Russian, the Russian Federation, and the US. And now the ITA, the ITA organization was officially established in 2007. And now we are through the fabrication and operation phase at Cadarache, France. And I have the, the opportunity actually to be involved in a few of these phases, starting with the CDA, then the EDA, and now the fabrication and operation phase in Cadarache. So if we look back a little bit at how the blanket evolved during these different phases, at first, during the CDA, we had a breeding blanket design where we used lithium ceramic breeder or lithium lead as a breeder and low temperature water as a coolant. With uh, lithium ceramic, we also had barium as a, as a neutron multiplier. You can see a schematic of how the, the blanket will look like, a cross-section of the blanket. And then during the EDA, uh, phase, uh, we decided to consider the operation of ITER in two phases, a so-called basic performance phase, where we would use a non-breeding simpler blanket, and then an enhanced performance phase later on, where the non-breeding blanket will be replaced by a breeding blanket, which will be a water cooled lithium ceramic one. And you can see here, typically, uh, this breeding, breeding blanket concept, which was considered during the EDA. Then, as from the late EDA phase and, and all the way to now, uh, basically the focus was on a shielding blanket, which is basically uh, a non-breeding blanket. So the, during the EDA, the, <coughs> the blanket was viewed as, a, in, as an integrated shield block and first wall, and with water temperature at 140 to 190 degrees C. 
And you could already see from, from this time, this was in the late 90s, some of the major features which are still used now in the current ether blanket, such as a modular arrangement, the attachment scheme with flexible supports at the back, the electrical straps to conduct the current to back of vessel, and the branch pipe connections for the water coolant connection. From this time, the focus was clearly then on the shielding non breeding blanket to reduce the complexity for the first ever blanket to operate in a fusion reactor. So the focus then was a non breeding low temperature, oscillating steel as structural uh, material and barium armor, which is now the heater blanket. So the heater blanket then will cover most function of a reactor blanket. And the TBM program in heater will cover the rest. You can see the function one to five here are covered by heater. The two functions that the heater blanket doesn't cover, which is to breed tritium to show that tritium self-sufficiency can be achieved, and also to remove energy deposition with high quality, which means high temperature coolant for effective power generation. These two functions, we will have a lot of information from testing of demo relevant test blanket modules in the ETA equatorial ports. So this is how we're going to learn a lot about the blanket from the base blanket in ETA and also from the TBM program. Let's look now at the current blanket ETA design. You can see the ETA tokamak on the top left there, and then you can see a typical sector. This, and the sector consists of a number of blanket modules going from the bottom left, from module one to six is called the, in the inboard, module seven to 10 on the top is the, is the top region, and module 11 and 18 is, on the, is the outboard region. And this sector, the, 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 blanket, the blanket module in these sectors are basically fed by a blanket manifold system. The coolant that flows in and out from the blanket manifold system. If we look at each module, blanket module, it is basically made up of a shield block at the back, on top of which a first wall panel is attached. And you can see the first wall panel facing the plasma with the green being the barium tiles, which, which face the plasma. And then you have a blanket module connection that are used to attach the, the shield block to the back and vessel at the back. And you can see how the procurement is divided between the different parties. Uh, in the case of a blanket manifold system, it is being procured by the European Domestic Agency. The first wall panel is being procured by the Chinese dom Domestic Agency, 10% of it by the Chinese Domestic, domestic Agency, 50% by Europe, and 40% by Russia. The shield block is 50-50 between China and Korea, and the blanket module connections are procured by uh, the Russian Federation. It's a blanket design challenge. As I mentioned before, this is the first of a kind fusion blanket in the first of a kind fusion experimental reactor. The blanket is one of the most challenging components to be designed for ITER. It has to accommodate high heat fluxes from the plasma during steady state, but also during off normal events large electromagnetic loads from AD and ELO currents, its interfaces with major systems and components, a lot of interfaces. It is attached mostly against gravity, and it needs to accommodate often conflicting, conflicting requirements from interfacing systems. For example, for diagnostics and other systems, they need cutouts or gaps through the blanket, but for the component at the back, they need neutron shielding, which means that you need to reduce the gaps and cutouts. So there's always some sort of uh, uh, balance between the different conflicting requirements to be had. Now, for historical reasons, the interfacing components at ITER were and still are at substantially different levels of maturity, which creates a major interface issue. Okay. For example, the vacuum vessel was already in procurement when the blanket was still in the design phase. Now the blanket is in procurement. We have diagnostic systems still in the design phase. And the blanket is right in the middle of these different components. And I would say, we often use that when talking about the, the, the blanket, we talk about the Ghostbuster, the Ghostbuster syndrome. There was a movie a number of years ago called Ghostbuster. You can see the little logo here. And there was a, a song from it. And the song said that there's something strange happening in the neighborhood. Who you're going to call? So it's a bit the same with the blanket. If there's a problem somewhere, who you're going to call? If you need more shielding because the, the toroidal field calls, uh, the heat in the toroidal field calls is too high, you call the blanket to try to increase the shielding. If the, there's a uh, plasma scenario which changes, resulting with higher heat fluxes on the first wall, who you're going to call to accommodate, accommodate it, the blanket. 
if there's a gas injection system which needs to be reconfigured, who you're gonna call the blanket to, to able to accommodate that, and diagnostic the same. So basically, <laughs> this is why we call it the Ghostbuster syndrome. And this is a major lesson for future reactor. It's very important that the design integration, which is a key element, but the design integration of interfacing components should be developed over time at similar design level and with realistic tolerances. So in the case of ITER, our design must take into account interfaces with many other systems, including physical interfaces, with vacuum vessel manifolds and all the other components shown here, functional interfaces with the physics scenarios for startup and ramp down of the plasma, the flat top during the burn, off normal events, this create heat and EM loads on the blanket, neutron shielding, we need to protect the coils and vacuum vessel as best we can from the neutron heating, and then removal of the fusion power from, <coughs> and then we have the tokamak cooling water system, which, which basically interfaces with us and also the manifold and others. So in a few numbers, the ITER blanket system, you have 440 blanket modules in all. The maximum allowable mass for each module is 4.5 tons. This is based on, the, on remote handling requirement. In order, to, in order to maintain the blanket, we cannot go higher than 4.5 tons, which means that the total mass is about 1,500 tons. The first wall coverage surrounding the plasma is 600, about 600 meters square. And as material, as armor material facing the plasma, we use beryllium. At each sink just behind, we use a high, highly conductive material, which is a, an alloy of copper, copper, chromium, zirconium. And as structural material, we use stainless steel 316 heater grade. And the maximum total thermal load to be removed from the blanket is 678 megawatt to be removed by the cooling system. If we include also the ports, this goes up to 736 megawatt. And the cooling water conditions at the inlet are four megapascal of pressure and 70 degree Celsius temperature. Let's look now at the different components of the blanket. First, the first wall design. The first wall is subjected to normal and off normal heat fluxes from the plasma. Just to simplify a little bit, this just gives a schematic of the first wall from first wall 1 to 18, like at module 1 to 18. It has to handle steady state heat fluxes from the plasma when the plasma is radiating. So the, all the radiation from the plasma needs to be accommodated by the first wall, uh, 1 to, to 18. When you start up the plasma, typically on the inboard on first wall 3, 4, 5, or when you ramp down, could be on the inboard or on the outboard from 14, 15, 16, or 17. Typically, the heat fluxes there tend to be higher. So the blanket has to be designed, the first wall there has to be designed to handle this. And on top of that, sometimes you have disruption of the plasma due to instabilities. And, and, and before the plasma is quenched and dies, if you want, you have a lot of energy which is liberated and which is deposited on the first wall. And this creates also a, quite a design challenge. So how do we deal with these different high uh, heat fluxes to the, to the first wall? So we use shaping of the first wall panels. So the heat load associated with the charged particles in the plasma represent the main component of heat flux to the first wall during operation. And this heat flux is oriented along the magnetic field lines. It follows the field lines around the torus. So this incident heat flux then is strongly design dependent. It depends on the incidence angle between the field line and the component surface, the first wall surface. Now in the first wall, we have leading edges because first wall, one first wall is separated by the other. You have a gap and a leading edge. We have a slot in the middle of the first wall to accommodate remote handling. So we need to protect or shadow these leading edges at the gap between the two first wall or for the slot. And this is why we use uh, shaping. At the, on the bottom left, you can see an exaggerated first wall shaping, which, um, which gives you a better idea. You can see the magnetic field lines, which basically hit the first wall, but the remote handling access, the slot is protected. The, the particle fluxes which follow magnetic field lines will not impact the, the, the slot area. So this allows good access for remote handling and the shadowing of all leading edges. So that's why we adopt first wall uh, shaping. Because then of a different distribution of heat fluxes in the first wall, we have two different kinds of first wall panel configuration. 
We have a so-called normal heat flux, which are designed for two megawatt per meter square. And we have enhanced heat flux panels, which are designed for 4.7 megawatt per meter square. These EHF panels, designed for 4.7 megawatt per meter square, typically have the inboard to start up the plasma, first wall three, four, five, and at the outboard for ramp down, 14, 15, 16, 17, and in the top region, seven, eight, nine, where you have a secondary X point and where the heat fluxes is higher. All the other first wall panels are designed for two megawatt per meter square, the so-called normal heat flux. Just to give you an idea what this means in terms of heat fluxes, if you, on a summer sunny day on the beach, the, the, the heat flux from the sun is about 0 0.001 megawatt per meter square. We are designing from two to five roughly megawatt per meter square. Even the space shuttle, I'm sure you've, you must have seen pictures of a space shuttle before, where you have a number of tiles at the bottom, basically to accommodate the friction heat for the shuttle re-entering the Earth atmosphere. And the heat flux of the, of the shuttle sees there is 0.5 megawatt per meter square, which is about a tenth of the heat flux that some of the first whole panel will see, just to give you an idea as a comparison. So how do we design the first world design? <laughs> how do we design the first world? The normal heat flux, which is being procured by the EUDA, uses a fairly conventional design in a sense, uh, at least in terms of configuration, where you have a barium tiles, and then just behind it, you have a copper chromium zerk alloy as a heat sink, in the middle of which you have cooling channel, the plasma side, I would say, cooling channels. At the back in blue, in dark blue, you have a structural uh, material, the stainless steel 316, with also a bigger channel there. So typically, if, if you look at the figure just on top of it, the coolant will come in, will cool the first wall plasma side, and then we come back and pull the back, the, the larger channel of the back, and then we'll exit. For the enhanced flux, which is being procured by the Russian DA and the Chinese DA, it has to be designed for a higher heat flux. So we need a special design, which we call a hypervapotron, which basically, shown is orange there, are a bunch of teeth along the channel. And with these teeth along the channel, this helps the heat transfer to be much better than in a conventional design. Okay, so we use this hypervapotron design, and then we use a different techniques to, in order to bond the material together. Uh, I don't want to get too much detail there, but basically in both cases, uh, heaping hot isotopic pressing would be used, uh, and uh, and also brazing would be used for the barium to cover chromium uh, zirconium bond. Now let's look at uh, what we call off normal events. So when the plasma is operating, sometimes you can have global instability, which will terminate the, pl the plasma, and this could be triggered by plant malfunction or some other plasma instabilities. So basically the, the plasma energy and the current decreases very fast once you have such a disruption because you, you lose vertical position control and these result in huge power fluxes to the plasma facing components, plus also forces, forces because of the, the current, uh, the product of current and magnetic field results in force. So this affects vacuum vessel and also all in vessel components, including uh, the blanket. And you can see that typically the plasma current quench occurs over the order of 100 milliseconds, whereas the thermal quench is much quicker. It occurs over one to 10 milliseconds. And what does it mean then? Uh, if you look at the figure uh, on the top, uh, the, uh, the graph on the top uh, the, with a yellow background, this shows the temperature of the armor following such a high energy deposition. Uh, you can see that it goes past 2000 degrees, much higher than the melting point of beryllium. So you're going to melt and evaporate beryllium. On the right there, you can see the melt layer thickness up to about one millimeter. So the strategy then is to make sure that we can, we have only a few such dis disruption and that we can use a disruption mitigation system to mitigate the effect of disruption by injecting a pellet inside when the disruption is about to occur. And then this will reduce the heat flux to the, to the first wall, and the first wall will be able to accommodate many more of these uh, mitigated disruption. You can see at the bottom a typical example where the temperature for a mitigated disruption is much lower. Actually, in this case, you don't even melt the beryllium, but you do evaporate a little bit, but, but really a, a very small fraction. So the strategy then is to set the beryllium armor thickness as thick as possible, 
within the constraint of maintaining the, the maximum barium temperature to 600 degrees C in general, or 800 degrees C in some local zones. And this resulted in choosing an armor thickness of 8 to 10 millimeter, 8 millimeter for the EHF first wall and 10 for the NHF first wall. And you can see then that this can give you only the possibility of accommodating a few non-mitigated disruption, which you're going to use of the other one millimeter each time. Now we look at the shield block and blanket module connections at the back. So this is an example of shield block, which is shield block number four. You can see uh, uh, at the front of the shield block, there are a number of slits and these slits are included for two reasons. One is to reduce the EM loads. When you put the slits, then the, the, the eddy current loops are much smaller. This reduces, reduces the current. And when the current crosses the magnetic field to produce the forces, it reduces the forces also and the stresses on the material, on the component. And it also minimizes thermal expansion and bowing. Inside the shield block, cooling holes are designed to provide a required thermal hydraulic performance while aiming for a water to stainless steel ratio, which will result in good nuclear shielding performance. You can see on the graph, in the graph on the right, uh, but basically between 80 and 90% of steel fraction will give, or 95, even 95, will give you a good shielding performance, uh, the rest being water. And you can see also at the back of the shield block a number of cutouts to accommodate many interfaces, such as the manifold, attachment, the vessel coil, etc. This shield block will be attached to the vacuum vessel using the blanket module connections. Uh, this includes flexible cartridges, which are shown there. It also includes electrical stops to help conduct the current from the blanket to vacuum vessel. And on the top right, you can see a typical prototype of an electrical strap. Uh, you also have a number of pads which are used uh, where the keys from vacuum vessel basically uh, interfaces with the keyholes of the shields of the, of the shield block. And you can see on the right also an intermodular, pa uh, intermodular pad prototype. Uh, here it has been set up for custom machining. Uh, so these different module, blanket module connections are being procured by, uh, by Russia. It's very important, but we're talking about the, the shield block and the vacuum vessel and the keys. So the keys on the vacuum vessel are used to react the torque on the shield block. You're going to have, during this disruption, you have high uh, for electromagnetic forces generated and moments. And these forces and moments have to be reacted by the keys. And we have to make sure that the load transferred to vacuum vessel is within their acceptable requirements. Vacuum vessel is, is, a, is a safety important class component. And it's very important that we don't exceed the load uh, requirement uh, on the vacuum vessel. And you can see here uh, on the left, typically for a category three load or category two load, the limit on the vacuum vessel is shown by the pink line for category three and by a blue line for category two. And all our calculations show that under both these categories, the, either the pink uh, diamonds or the blue circles are below the pink and blue line respectively. Actually, all our components are, are, are verified. I mean, we design the components, be it the first wall, the shield block, or others. And in most cases, this verification is done by analysis. So we, we perform electromagnetic, hydraulic, and thermal analysis first, and then the results are used to, as an input for the structural analysis and to assess the accept, acceptability of the design with regards to the design code. Here you can see an example of a shield block on the right a thermal analysis, where you can see maximum temperature is about 350 degrees C for the shield block in this case. This is shield block seven. In some cases, we cannot use design analysis because it's too complex. And then we use uh, what we call design validation by experiment, by cyclic testing under specified prototypical conditions of mockups representing the geometry uh, in question. In this case, for example, for the joint between the armor, barium armor in green and the copper chromium alloy in blue, in, in uh, pale blue, the joint there needs to be tested uh, or, or to be validated, if you want, by experiment. So let's look now at the qualification program and procurement. So as an example qualification program, let's look at what we did for the normal flux panels with uh, the EUDA. So typically, the qualification starts from doing very small size uh, sample tests to mock-up tests to then semi-prototype, full-scale prototype, and then eventually leading up to the series production. Uh, 
and typically you, you, you test different technologies, materials, design as you go along and validate them at, at these increasing scales. And you can see at the bottom, uh, along the way, we have conceptual design review to check where we're on the design, the preliminary design review, the final design review. In this case, with the EUDA, we signed the procurement arrangement, the fabrication contract, if you want, in 2017. And now the EUDA has just signed their contract signature with their supplier to start series production. They finished all these up all the way to full scale prototype. Same things will be applied to the other components. This is just an example. So we have seven blanket in kind procurement arrangements. All of them have been signed. We have two shield block PAs with uh, China and Korea. They have completed successfully their full scale prototype program and now they are in full swing in service production. And we have something like 80 plus uh, shield block now at different stages in the production line. We have three first world panels PA. Uh, the one with EUDA, as I mentioned, the full scale prototype program was successfully completed and they just signed their contract for service production. In the case of China and Russia, the full scale prototype, prototype program is ongoing. We have one blanket module connection PA with the Russian uh, DA. Uh, in this case, all the small components required for phase one assembly are being shipped to the IO. We've received some already. And the full scale prototype program is ongoing for other components. We have a blanket manifold PA with the EUDA. And they, right now, they are in, uh, through, through going through their call for tender for series production. And you can see the two examples below. One is a full-scale prototype from Korea for the chill block on the left, and a full-scale prototype for the first whole panel from the EUDA on the right. The blanket manifold system, this is the system that fits the water to the blanket. The design is being optimized. It is supported um, to the vacuum, vacuum vessel. It is supported by vacuum vessel. Uh, qualification and R&D tests are ongoing. We have signed the PA already with EUDA a couple of years ago in 2019. Actually, the design is quite complex because of interface and EM load constraints. It's not just designing a bunch of pipes. For example, the, the support to pipe connections has to be thermally conductive because you want to uh, basically transfer the heat generated in the support by the neutron energy deposition to the water in the pipe. But at the same time, you want this junction to be electrically insulating to maintain reasonable EM load. So it is quite challenging to have a very thermally conductive joint, but an electrically insulating one. And you can see the sketch on the, on the right of the manifold system and on the bottom typical manifold for, for one, uh, one sector. And, on, uh, and then you have also a, a picture of a full scale partial prototype that was manufactured to check the tolerance and assembly of such a, a component. So to, fi to finish, uh, the, the blanket will be installed uh, in ITER uh, as part of second assembly. For first assembly, where we're going to, which will last, and first assembly leading to first plasma, which will last maybe six months of operation. This is more to commission the, the, the big items at the back, like the, the magnets, the vacuum vessel, and other system. And to avoid the complexity of having a blanket there also, the blanket is not installed, nor is the diverter, by the way. So in order to protect the vacuum vessel from the plasma, we have first plasma protection components that are that have been designed and are being procured now, consisting of four temporary limiter belts, one diverter replacement structure, one electron cycloton resonance eating mirror, and one ECRH lamp. And these will be installed for first plasma operation and then removed, and the blanket will be installed after that for operation. So in summary, a blanket is essential for the operation of a fusion reactor. ITER will provide a range of key information in the development and operation of blankets for commercial reactors. We're going to learn important information from the interblanket itself on a range of topics, including integration, interface management, tolerances, assembly, remote maintenance. And then we're going to have test blanket modules, which basically, which will be used to obtain information for demo and beyond. And these will be designed, fabricated, installed, and tested to provide tritium breeding and higher temperature operation information. So the ITER blanket adventure, it has been and is very challenging. This is a first of a kind blanket to operate in a first of a kind fusion reactor. We have to be very organized in order to accommodate so many demanding constraints. We have to be stimulated. It has to be stimulating because we need to generate ideas sometimes to find solution 
when issues arise along the way, in particular when dealing with interface requirements. And then in terms of yardstick, we need to have the same yardstick, same one for all interfacing systems so that they can progress at a similar design development level to help solve integration issues. So after all, I started to say that maybe you have like it, you want to have quite a cozy feeling, but maybe after all, you do have quite a cozy feeling. So thank you for your attention and goodbye.